Welcome to LIBS 1540 or LIBS 1810, Student Success for Higher Learning. In this session, we're going to be talking about learning to read or chapter five in your textbook. If you're like me, you like reading and you'll read almost anything. However, if you're not like me, reading can be a chore. But when I talk about reading, I talk about reading for pleasure. And this can be anything from reading online journals or articles, reading Facebook posts, reading Instagram posts, reading interesting news online, doing some research to find out how to build something or repair something. All of this is considered reading. However, reading for college can be very, very difficult for almost anyone, regardless of whether your first language is English or not. Textbooks can be dry and boring. However, there are some strategies in order to make reading for college more successful for you. When we are looking at this chapter, the objectives that we're looking at are as follows. We're going to be looking at understanding the four steps of active reading, We'll be examining strategies for reading. We're also going to be talking about online reading because online reading is different from our regular textbook reading. We're also going to be talking about building vocabulary. And when we talk about reading for college, we talk about active reading. Passive reading is the reading that we do when we're reading for pleasure. We're not really interacting with the textbook or the text. We're just reading simply for the pleasure and we're absorbing the information. But for college, you need to be actively reading, which means you're looking for information. You're going to use strategies in order to be able to understand the textbook and get the most out of it. Active reading, we also use to improve our understanding. And we sit down and we plan to spend time doing our reading. And with active reading, we can absorb new ideas and information better than we can by just reading passively. Think about the last thing that you read for pleasure. Do you remember clearly what it was about? If it was a set of instructions, do you remember all of the instructions step by step? If you read a book, whether it's a novel or a comic book or even a magazine, can you remember the main points of it? If you're like me, probably not. There are times I even have to go back and reread paragraphs because I don't remember where I was in a book. However, with active reading, this isn't as much of a problem. When we look at reading in the learning cycle, we look at the role of reading. And we talked about the learning cycle before, and the learning cycle consists of preparing, absorbing new ideas, recording our ideas, and reviewing and applying that information. And the cycle continues. It's a, a continual circle. So preparing means that you're getting ready for class. So you want to go through and you want to read through your textbook. You're also going to want to read through the PowerPoint slides. But as we're reading, we're absorbing new ideas. As you can see, it says listen, read, observe. We can also take notes while we're reading, which helps us with the recording. And then after class, we can go back and we can review both our notes and the notes that we created as we were in our lecture. So when it comes to reading in college, you're expected to do a lot of reading, especially in your regular programs. So it's important to set aside some time to, to read before you go to class. And this will help you understand better what is being talked about in the lecture. And just so that you know, for every hour that you spend in class, you're expected to do a minimum of an additional hour in reading. You'll have to read a variety of sources, not just your textbook, but you'll have to do research for essays and for projects. 
And so you're expected to read magazines, newspapers, journal articles, all sorts of information. Now there are four steps in your active reading. The first step, of course, is preparing. So you want to make sure that you're all ready and set to go. The second step is actually doing the reading. The, the third is capturing your key ideas. And then the fourth is reviewing. So we'll get into these steps in more detail now. So when we're preparing to read, it's important that you're in a position where you're comfortable. It's not a good idea generally to read a textbook as you're lying down on your bed. You want to make sure that you're sitting in an upright position so that you're able to really focus on what it is that you're reading. And then when you're looking at your textbook for the first time, look at the front matter of the textbook. So the table of contents. And if your teacher has assigned you to study one particular chapter, again, look at the table of contents. How is it divided? How is that chapter organized? Then you want to go to the chapter itself and look at the chapter title. Then look at the headings that are within the chapters and the illustrations, so pictures, graphics, uh, <clears throat> charts. Those will all help you get an idea of what the main ideas are in that particular chapter. Page 172 in our textbook has an explanation of the different textbook features if you're unfamiliar with them. Now, before you start to read, you want to set a purpose. So again, you want to read with a particular goal in mind. So it could be finding out four main points from the chapter. It could be finding out what the most important information is. It could be finding four key new words that you need. You also want to make sure that you have a place that you can take notes. We're going to be talking more about taking notes in Chapter 4, but you can take notes in the margin of your textbook, or you can create a separate note page in your binder if you want. And you also want to create questions that you want to answer. And these questions could be based on the headings that you find in the chapter. So for example, in this textbook, in this chapter, we're talking about active reading. So your question could be, what is active reading? Or it could be, how do I read actively? Another question could be, why is it important to know how to read online? So once you've gone to your reading, you want to make sure that before you start reading, you look at the questions that you have created for yourself and determine that you're going to answer those questions. And then, just as in any essay, textbook paragraphs are usually written with the topic sentence in the first or second sentence of each paragraph. So if you don't have a lot of time to read the full textbook, reading the first couple of sentences of a paragraph can be equally beneficial. You also want to look at the relationship between the different sections and look at the bold-faced words because those are often hints that those are key words that you need. And again, don't ignore the graphics. There are some times that textbooks will add examples to help you understand what the textbook is talking about. But if those particular things are not related to your key questions, then you can skim over those. When you're reading, you also want to capture your ideas. So again, like the learning cycle, capturing is very important. Capturing helps you remember the ideas better. So you want to write down the answers to your questions. And you also want to make sure that you're defining key words that you found in the reading. Then, once you've gone through the textbook the first time, go through it a second time with your highlighter or a colored pen and highlight or underline key words or ideas. If you are using this method, though, make sure that you are highlighting 
or underlining less than 10% of your textbook. If you do any more than this, you run into the risk of not knowing what the most important things are in the textbook. You can also make margin notes in your textbook. So if your first language is not English and you are having trouble understanding a particular point, maybe translate that into your own language. Or if you have further questions, put a question mark down. Also look for signal words because these will often give you key points as well. They'll also tell you where something is <clears throat> of a different bent. So words like according to or however or this is critical, or this is significant. Pay attention to those because those give you an idea of what the most important ideas are in your textbook. You also want to make sure that you're reviewing what you learned. So once you've finished reading, ask yourself, what did I learn? What does it mean? If you want to and you have time, you could write a very brief summary of what you've learned. It can be only a couple of sentences. And go back again and look at the questions you created them and answer them out loud. Speaking out loud for some reason helps us retain this information even better than just reading it. If the textbook has review questions at the end of the chapter, try doing those as well, because this will tell you whether you've learned the key concepts or not. There are a couple of strategies that you need to look at when you're actually reading the textbook. The first one is pace yourself. If you have trouble reading textbooks and you don't like reading, then don't sit down and decide you have to read the whole chapter in one sitting. This can often cause you to fall asleep or lose interest or become very, very bored. So break the text up into different segments. And again, the saying, inch by inch, life's a cinch, is something that is very good to remember. Because if you read your textbooks in little chunks, it becomes much easier to get through them. Make sure you are scheduling reading time in your daily schedule as well. And get yourself into the right space. So turn off your electronics, turn off your phone, turn off the internet, and just focus on reading. Avoid distractions and avoid reading fatigue. This happens when you just get so tired, you don't absorb any new ideas anymore. You can also read your most difficult assignments early. This way you feel good because you've checked off a difficult task and you won't procrastinate. Also, you can make your reading more interesting. Ask yourself how what you're reading is applied, can be applied to your own life. So for example, what we're talking about right now, how can you use these strategies in all of your classes to make reading less challenging? Now we're going to be moving on to dealing with special texts. And these are mathematics texts, science texts, social studies, so things like psychology, history, geography. We're going to talk about reading primary sources and foreign language textbooks. We're also going to talk briefly about family reading and how to manage your time with your family. And finally, we're going to be talking about online reading. So when we look at math texts, again, it's important to pay attention to the formulas the charts, the sample problems, and the exercises. And you want to make sure that you are practicing the formulas so that you know that you understand how to do them. And actually work on these problems on your own as well. You want to make sure that you're doing the exercises so that you do understand what it is that you're studying and you understand the concepts. And you really want to make sure that you understand the information in that section before you move on to a new one. If you don't, it just becomes very confusing. And finally, if you're really having difficulty, seek help. You can ask one of your 
fellow classmates for help. You could also ask your professor for help. And finally, you can go to the student success office because they have math tutors there and they can help you. If you are doing this course remotely, you can access the student success services online and also get online help. Graphics, as I've mentioned, are an important part of every textbook. They're put in there to help you understand, to help you visualize the information. So it might be a pie chart, it might be a graph chart, it could be a visual, a picture. Looking at these really helps you understand what the information is all about. Textbook authors choose these graphics carefully in order to help you. They're not put just to make the textbook pretty. You want to make sure that you read the title and the caption and the labeling as well so that you understand what the graphic is all about. You can also think about what is going to happen if you're looking at data, what is going to happen in the future? What information could be added to this? And your textbook from pages 180 to 185 have examples of graphics that you will encounter. With scientific texts, you want to look at the hypothesis. You want to look at the proof for the hypothesis or the disproof. You want to look critically at the information. Does this make sense? For example, if you're reading a psychology textbook and they're talking about an experiment, you can ask yourself whether it can be repeated. Can it be replicated? Can it be observed? You can also ask yourself why the results occurred and what kinds of changes could affect the results. So for example, if someone was studying how students read and how students are successful reading, the study could be talking about students between the ages of 18 to 20. So if the results are there for students from 18 to 20, how could those results be different if we looked at an older age group or a younger age group? So if we change the experiment, how would things change? What would your results be? And how could you measure those results? And finally, you want to look at the conclusions reached and see if they're actually believable or not and ask yourself if the results can be interpreted in a different way. Critical thinking when you're looking at textbooks is very important because we don't always get the same results from doing an experiment in science. The social science texts, such as history, economics, and political science, again, you want to look for an author's bias. So why is the author using a particular argument? And is the information consistent with what you've learned in class? And if not, why? You can also ask if you agree with the argument and look at your own reasons for agreeing or disagreeing. Would someone with a different point of view argue with, with you about your point of view? And what are the key things that could be used in an argument against what the textbook is stating. Again, this is critical thinking, and it's important to do this because we can't just accept everything that we read, even if it is in a textbook. The foreign language texts, of course, are something that is very, very different because we're reading in another language. So what you want to do is look at short portions of the text and analyze them. See if you can actually infer the meaning without using a dictionary. It's important to try to read as much as possible without using a dictionary, because this will actually help you improve your reading ability. Also, if you're looking up words in a dictionary all the time, the speed of your reading is very, very slow. 
Now, if you can't infer the meaning, go back and choose a few keywords and look those up in the dictionary. And then try again to see if you can read through the passage and understand. Don't use word-for-word -word translations either, as they are not always accurate, as you can see from the examples that I have included on the slide. And finally, seek help if the reading is overwhelming for you. Again, you can go to people that are in your course, you can go to your professors, or you can go to online experts who can help you as well. <clears throat> reading in your family is something that is really important as well. Whether you're living at home with your parents or you have family members around, a spouse or children, it's important to remember that there will be times that you can read without interruptions, but those are few and far between. So you want to schedule your reading time for when you have the fewest interruptions. And also let your family know that you are going to be reading. And one final thing, you can take your reading on the bus with you, or you can take it when you're going shopping, because maybe you'll have the chance to sit down and read for a few minutes. And finally, we're going to look at online reading. Because online reading is different from reading a textbook. We get lots of information online. We can go almost anywhere. We can Google a source. We can Google a headline. We can go to places like Yahoo News. There's all sorts of information available at our fingertips that wasn't in previous generations. Facebook is an example of a place where you can get lots of information. But when you're reading online, you want to remember to use the CARS test. Is the information you're getting credible? Is it accurate? Is it reliable or even reasonable? And is there support for this? When we're reading online, there are a few things to remember. The first one is to look at the URL. If it's .com or .biz, these are often commercial sites and they're often used to sell products or services. .org is for not-for-profit organizations, and .edu is for education in the U.S. Unfortunately, in Canada, we don't have the same distinction, so most colleges and universities just use .ca. You also want to check the masthead of the page, see who the organization is, and check the quality of the information. Again, does their information pass the CARS test? And what are others saying about the site? And you want to make sure that you trust your impressions. Is the information believable or not? If you don't think so, then you're probably right. Also, when you're reading online, remember that we don't read the same way online that we do when we're reading a book. When we're reading an English textbook, we read from left to right. When we're reading online, our eyes follow more of a zigzag pattern. So when you're reading online, you don't always get the same information. So sometimes it's better to print out the page and read it on paper than it is to try to read it online. One of the things about college is that you're going to find that you build your vocabulary. This is because you're taking new programs or because you're learning new vocabulary in your electives. But we always find that our vocabulary builds while we were in college. So while you're reading, look for these new words and write them down along with the sentences that they're in. Try to understand the meaning based on the context or the paragraph that the information is in. If you still can't figure it out, then look it up in the dictionary. You can keep a vocabulary log and write the word in a sentence that has meaning for you. And say the word out loud. And try to use that word 
when you're in conversation or even writing for the next two, two or three days. And you also want to make sure that you're scheduling a weekly review so that you can go back and look at the new vocabulary that you're finding. Now, when we're finding new words, we find these through reading. You can also look up interesting words in the dictionary. Crossword puzzles can also expose you to new words. But be aware that crossword puzzles are also very, very culturally bound. So if you're not familiar with the culture, it may be more difficult to do crossword puzzles. Playing games like Scrabble or Boggle or Pictionary with native speakers will also help you learn new vocabulary, as will watching movies. Going to comedy clubs or even watching comedy videos will also help because a lot of comedy videos use idioms and they use slang that is more up to date than a lot of your professors will use. Have conversations with people. Conversations with people improves your vocabulary because everyone has a different take on words. They also understand different words. They've been exposed to different words. So speaking to other people can help improve your vocabulary. And if you don't understand what a word means, ask that person. For example, when I was teaching in Japan, I was teaching with a fellow Canadian, but he was from Saskatchewan. And instead of him saying something was forbidden, he always said it was verboten. I didn't understand what it meant, so I asked him and found out it meant forbidden. He came from a German background where they use that word quite regularly. So there's nothing wrong with asking somebody for further information. And don't forget reading. Reading is so important. So the chapter takeaways that we have are remembering that reading involves the learning cycle, preparing, absorbing, recording, and reviewing. An active reading has four steps. So the scanning of the material, the reading the material, answering your questions, highlighting and annotating the text, and reviewing your notes. Look for clues in the textbook that will tell you what is important information. And always think critically about what you're reading. For our special texts and situations, again, remember to do the exercises in math textbooks. Make sure you don't ignore the illustrations and the graphics. Think critically all the time about what you're reading. For foreign texts, don't rely on word-for-word -word translations. When you want to read and you have family around, let your family know that this is time for you to read so you need quiet. When you're doing online reading, you want to make sure that you're using the CARS test for online reading. And finally, <clears throat> get help for learning to read textbooks. Professors are often a big help there. Again, a few things about vocabulary. A stronger vocabulary makes reading much easier. And you want to look for new words all around you. And when you encounter a new word or you hear a new word or see a new word, write it down. Try to infer its meaning from all of the other words around it. Look it up in a dictionary. Use the word in your own sentence. Say the word in a sentence and find the opportunity to use the word. So that's it for reading for college. We will discuss any questions that you have during the lecture portion. But I hope that you found this helpful and that reading textbooks will no longer be very difficult.